Uh, my name is Nate Simpson. I'm the creative director for KSP2. It's been almost it's been almost two years since Kerbal Space Program 2 was first revealed. How has the game's development progressed since then, and how much of it was affected by the pandemic? Well, that's a good question. Uh, well, obviously, there's been about two years of progress since the last time we talked about the game. Um, one big change is that we've been able to actually release a lot more footage of the, the game actually working as opposed to kind of assets seen in isolation. Uh, in fact, one, one of the nice problems we've had recently is uh, members of the community feeling as though we were releasing canned assets and us getting to tell them, no, that's actually how good the game looks right now. Uh, so it's, uh, it's looking really, really good. Um, and obviously we're in the final stretch we're releasing and we're releasing next year. So uh, yeah, right now it's, as, as I'm sure you can imagine, it's all about seeing all of these larger portions get sewn together into co a cohesive whole. And uh, yeah, it's sort of the culmination of a lifelong dream seeing this thing actually become real. Uh, you, 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 I think you had, there was a good point of your question about uh, working during oh, right. the pandemic. Yes. Um, it's been hard for everybody, as I'm sure you know. Um, I mean, everybody meaning everyone <laughs> uh, in our society. Um, and yeah, it definitely took some adjustment to, to get used to working remotely. Uh, you know, probably fairly universal set of challenges as far as like knowing when to call a meeting and carving out amounts of time to be able to focus on whatever your immediate task is and stuff like that. Um, but I would say we've kind of hit our stride uh, and yeah, I, personally, um, it's not all downsides for me. I, I, I've definitely, at the very least, the, the hour that I would be spending at the beginning and end of the day commuting is now an hour that I can sneak a little bit extra testing or a little extra concepting. There was so much of the original Kerbal Space Program that was based in reality, and KSP2 is still sticking with that, but you also want to go beyond and into the more theoretical in the sense that now players can explore beyond the boundaries of the known solar system. So how have you gone about designing the outer cosmos and how do you approach what that would even look like? Uh, a big part of it is working closely with subject matter experts. Um, and it does get challenging when you're moving into technologies or concepts that are not speculative, but certainly um, aspirational. Uh, we actually had to lay out a set of ground rules when we first started working on the game as far as what technologies were and were not in bounds for the product uh, and you know warp drives were out of bounds right there so there's, there's nothing that kind of resembles magic technology uh, whatever we bring into the game has to be rooted in real science there needs to be at least the possibility of us achieving this in the relatively near future and it needs to be something we could tell a story about um, that is that's informative Right. So, uh, you know, whether we're, we're developing new fuel types or new engine types, there's always a desire to make sure that if a person looks this thing up on Wikipedia, they'll discover that there's a real concept behind it. Uh, and you're right. Now that the game is interstellar, uh, it's not just confined to a single star system like the original game was. Um, uh, we've had to do a little bit more exploration, <laughs> literal exploration, in, as far as what alien solar systems can look like. There's a little bit of anthropic principle involved in the Kerbola system in many ways resembles our solar system in terms of its distribution of terrestrial planets and gas giants and that sort of thing. Um, and we found as when we were working with one of our subject matter experts, Dr. Joel Green at Johns Hopkins, um, he was telling us that we weren't, we weren't being weird enough Initially, we were concerned we were going too far with some of these new celestial body designs. And he was saying, no, no, look at all the stuff we've actually already found. If there's a rule these days, it's that there is no rule. Like we're finding thousands and thousands of exoplanets now, and they're, they're exotic beyond human conception. So uh, that really kind of freed us up to, to create some interesting new variations on what you might expect otherwise. What can you tell me about colonies and what it takes to build and sustain them? Sure. Um, so colonies kind of have two major phases of growth. Um, 
in either case, the colony is assembled in a, a base assembly editor, which is similar to the vehicle assembly building in uh, that you've seen in QSP-1. You have a part pallet on the left side and you pull out components, you click them together, it forms a contiguous structure. And that structure is affected by gravity and local conditions and solar exposure and all of those things. Um, uh, but when you initially establish a, colon, a colony, you're bringing um, prefabricated, relatively lightweight elements via vehicle, which is how things will work in the real world, right? You're, you're, you're not building stuff on Mars, you're building stuff on Earth and sending it to Mars. Um, similarly, once you've established a base of operations and you're able to collect local resources, and the resource system for KSB2 is uh, much more diverse and, and much more much broader uh, than in the original game. Uh, you're collecting those resources and you're using in situ resource utilization or ISRU to uh, grow the colony organically. So as the colony's capabilities expand, it's able to uh, add to itself without you flying new components to it. And then you can really get quite ambitious and the scale of these colonies can get quite large. And of course, the main thing that that un unlocks is the ability to build new vehicle assembly buildings at those colonies. And you can build those either on your terrestrial colonies or in orbit, in orbital colonies. And it's especially when you have the ability to build vehicles on orbit that the, the brakes come off and you're able to build skyscraper sized interstellar vehicles that are able to carry you know, large amounts of fuel and conduct these very long duration, long burn, continuously accelerating uh, trajectories to other stars. It sounds like there's a lot to space exploration and from the perspective of a beginner, it looks really intimidating. So how are you going about designing KSB2 so that it's friendly to novices or people who are just starting out? It's, a, it's great that you asked that question now because we just released a feature video about approachability. Um, and, and what's really critical for us, this is in fact, I think one of, one of the main reasons I'm as excited as I am about this game, is that we have preserved the challenge at the center of Kerbal Space Program, right? It is still a universe of unforgiving physical laws. Um, but we have pretty much completely overhauled uh, the first time user experience so that you are experiencing uh, animated tutorials, uh, interactive tutorial experiences that give you access to these core concepts uh, which which equip you to succeed in that unforgiving universe. So we have not made the game easier. The physics are just as hard as they ever were. But what we're trying to do is equip players with more core concepts so that when they fail, they fail constructively. I mean, one of the, one of the key lessons of Kerbal Space Program always has been and continues to be uh, you must fail to succeed, right? That, that, that adage, uh, failure is not an option, totally the opposite of the reality of, of space exploration. Failure is absolutely mandatory in order to ever achieve anything in space exploration. So we want to celebrate failure. And, and part of the way that we do that, though, is, is make sure that the player has access to the information they need, that they can get something out of every failure, as opposed to just feeling stuck and like there's just some inexplicable random thing that's going wrong. Um, so, so based on our earliest user testing, uh, we're fairly confident that we are doing a much uh, better job of, of giving people that kind of foundational knowledge they need to, to, to learn from their setbacks. How is multiplayer going to work in KSB2? How many players can jump into a session and how can they work together? We have a big announcement on that coming up in the future, so I am not able to get into uh, detail about multiplayer play at the moment. Um, you know, other than to say what I've, I've said in, in the recent past, which is that um, you could sort of extrapolate if you've played, I don't, have, have you played Kerbal Space Program at all? I played it bits and pieces, yes. Bits and pieces. So, so if you think about the kind of slapstick and the kind of emergent improvisational stuff that tends to happen when you're playing single player KSP, it doesn't take a huge amount of, of imagination to uh, envision what it might mean when all your buddies are there with you uh, trying to do similar things. Um, so I, I'm very excited to give more details about that in the future, but right now I just have to leave it annoyingly vague 
my apologies. Modding was such a key component to the original Kerbal Space Program, and how important is it that the team makes this game as mod-friendly as the original? Uh, very, very important. In fact, we've we've set ourselves the goal of making the game uh, more moddable. Um, obviously, because we were able to kind of design the architecture from the ground up, starting day one, um, we're able to make things in a more modular way to expose APIs. Uh, to, to generally make things hopefully more accessible to modders. We're hoping that the modding community just jumps right into KSP2 without missing a beat. What sorts of new modding possibilities are opened up by KSP2's new features? Uh, that's a good question uh, and probably one that's better asked of someone with uh, a, a better coding, a, a better coding background than I have. Um, I can speak a little bit, for example, to um, uh, parts modding and that sort of thing, uh, which is to say, um, because we're using a, a generation of Unity that's a, a full decade advanced from the original games, uh, we're using a, a PBR render pipeline, uh, which means that the way that you prepare those parts assets uh, gives you a lot more control over their final presentation. And there's all kinds of you know lighting controls, reflection probes, uh, the, the entire PBR pipeline results in a much more higher fidelity uh, final product. So, and, and I know a lot of people in the part modding community are champing at the bit to get an opportunity to make beautiful new parts using the PBR pipeline. So that's one example of cool stuff people will probably be, be digging into fairly quickly once we get underway. You know, a lot's changed since KSP2 was first announced and one of those changes is we have new hardware across both PC and consoles. Has the release of that new hardware affected development in any way? And has it opened up new possibilities for what you can do with the game? I'd say our focus for the most part is actually uh, on the min spec experience. Um, obviously the, the game <laughs> probably, you know, the sky's the limit as far as what your personal machinery is able to achieve, but um, you know, a lot of the comments we get from the community when we release uh, footage from our game it, it relates to concern around, wow, this looks amazing. My potato is never going to be able to handle this game. And we would like those people to have uh, a positive experience. So, so I would say uh, much more of our bandwidth goes to making sure that a large number of people have a positive experience, that you're not running into the same kind of CPU constraints around the simulation or rigid body arrays. I mean, we need people to be able to build very large vehicles, for example, um, especially with colony building, like you're gonna get up into high park counts. So it's important for us not to have your frame rate fall to its knees, uh, even if you're on a quote unquote normal computer. So um, yeah, that's kind of where most of our focus is these days. I have to ask about the Kerbals themselves. How are the Kerbals themselves changing from KSB to KSB2? That's a great question. Um, aesthetically, uh, they they haven't changed a huge amount. I mean, you can probably see from the art that we've released, um, we've actually had some fairly detailed discussions with Squad, the developers of KSP1 around uh, they are a little worried that we're going to polish them up too much or, or, or make, them, make them too cute. So, so, for example, eye asymmetry is a thing that they were eager for us to preserve and, and one that we did preserve. Um, I think you'll see uh, more visual diversity from Kerbal to Kerbal, um, largely because when you're building space colonies, there is a need to represent much higher numbers of Kerbals. Uh, you're, you're now building a Kerbal civilization. Um, trying to think of like from a gameplay perspective, what I could get into. I, I mean, the cockpits are clear now, so you're you're seeing them all the time. They're, 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 they tend to be something that you generally only interact with on EVA in the original game. Um, but now all you got to do is zoom in on your vehicle and you will see uh, those Kerbals doing what they do in the cockpit. Uh, and we have diversified their reactions to external stimuli. Um, they have levels of panic, uh, and and they cycle up through just absolute like terror uh, if you if things get too crazy. 
Um, so that's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, and then obviously in support of multiplayer where we've introduced emotes, uh, so since you, you know, in a multiplayer context, the Kerbal plays much more of a role as your avatar as well. So it's important for you to be able to go up to somebody else in a multiplayer game and interact with them in funny ways. And lastly, for me, the original Kerbal Space Program wasn't just a fun game. It was a very valuable educational tool. It still is. It still is right now. So as we approach this 10th anniversary, what does it mean to you and Intercept to be able to carry on the legacy of a game that's taught so many people about space? It's everything. Uh, I mean, I can speak somewhat to the journey that I went through when I played KSP. I, I started playing KSP I think it was like version 0.15, it was like in 2012. And I came to it, I think, with a general interest in space topics, but but not really with a huge amount of pre-existing knowledge. And it was sort of a fun construction toy. It was almost like a, an artistic medium. I was just enjoying sticking stuff together and seeing what it did and laughing at the explosion. Um, and then I just something kind of insidious happened where I started to get a little bit obsessed with it. And I found myself like designing vehicles uh, in like the margins of my notes at like meetings at work. Um, and then I, I think it happened kind of stealthily, but it opened my eyes to kind of this new world of, of physics and space flight. Um, and, you know, suddenly I'm watching SpaceX launches. I'm subscribed to Scott Manley. My kid is watching Everyday Astronaut on repeat. Um, you know, so, so this game has changed my life for the better, even if I weren't working on KSB2. Just personally, my journey, it's, it's given me a larger universe, right? It's, it's given me a better understanding of the world. Um, and that's a, that's a very heavy torch to be carrying, right? I mean, it, it, it certainly beats the heck out of any other game I've ever played or worked on as far as something to be proud of and something to be engaged in, something that gets you out of bed in the morning, something that energizes the entire team. I mean, we all have a, have a profound sense of the possible effect that this game could have, especially if, if our goal of, uh, of welcoming a larger number of people into this experience is one that we achieve. Um, yeah, it's, it's incredibly exhilarating.